А, где? Good morning everyone. Please be seated. We are going to start the session in about a minute. A very good morning to everyone. I welcome you all to the second day of the Shanghai Corporation Organization Young Scientist Conclave 2023. We shall be continuing the thematic session on sustainable energy and energy storage. This session showcasing the theme of sustainable energy and energy storage is chaired by Dr. BLV Prasad and Dr. Ramakrishna Mate. Dr. B.L.V. Prasad is the director of the Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences, Bangalore, and a senior principal scientist at the Physical Materials Chemistry Division of National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, India. He will be joining with us online. Dr. H.S.S. Ramakrishna Mate is a scientist at Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences, Bangalore, India. We would like to inform you now that during the talks for both virtual participants and for speakers present here among us, we shall be streaming your live videos next to your PowerPoint presentations. For speakers who are present with us here, you may raise your hands to identify yourselves while your presentations are played so that the camera may capture you. Virtual participants are requested to turn on their cameras while your presentations are live streamed. There is a question and answer session at the end of the them thematic session 
where we will be taking questions from both virtual and participants present here with us. For asking questions, the participants present here may raise their hands and our volunteers will come to you with a mic. For the online participants, kindly type in your question in the chat box and we will be taking them at the end of the entire session. We now begin with the session. The first speaker for today is Pushkarev Artem Sergevich, head of the PEM Fuel Cells Laboratory, National Research Center, Kurchatov Institute, and he will be talking to us on the topic of water electrolyzers based on ion exchange membranes. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, a slight change. Uh, we shall begin with uh, the first talk by Tinku Casper de Silva, who is a research scholar at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. The uh, title for the talk is Selection of Suitable Locally Available Biomass as an Alternative Feedstock for Localized Biogas Production in Rural India. respected dignitaries and my dear colleagues. A very warm welcome to this presentation. I am Tingu Casper de Silva, a fourth year research scholar at the Center for Rural Development and Technology, IIT Delhi. Before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of STO, Young Scientist Conclave and DST for selecting me and giving me the opportunity to give a talk on selection of suitable locally available biomass as an alternative feedstock for localized biogas production in rural India. This work is being supervised by Professor Ramchandra, Professor Virendra Kumar Vijay from India, and Professor Cornel Kovacs from Hungary. In this presentation, we will be discussing on the identification of potential non-conventional feedstock that could be adopted for biogas production across India, and some of our research findings and future directions will be discussed. As we all know, the global energy scenario is shifting towards renewables. Biomass energy can play a crucial role in achieving carbon neutrality that India aims to achieve by the year 2070. Adopting anaerobic digestion is one of the prominent biomass conversion routes for simultaneous bioenergy and biofertilizer production, achieving sustainable development goals of affordable and clean energy, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. Adoption of anaerobic digestion can also incorporate several national level schemes such as Sustainable Alternative Towards Affordable Transportation, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, Kobardhan, and NNBOMP. So far, cattle dung was the conventional feedstock that was used for biogas production. Later, biomass such as agricultural waste, agro industrial waste, fruit and vegetable waste, wastewater, de oiled cakes, etc., came into existence. However, these materials are prone to spatial and temporal variations. So this research aims to provide a best feedstock that can give a substantial biogas production irrespective of region and temporal changes. So what we have done was that we had partitioned the study into two parts. That is the preliminary assessment where the suitable substr uh, substrates available in India are shortlisted from the literature according to various parameters Using the multi-criteria decision-making approach, the best feedstock will be taken and subjected to confirmatory assessment using various experimental analyses. So in the pre preliminary assessment, we had shortlisted six feedstock, that is the rice straw, feed straw, sugarcane bagasse, yard waste, leaf waste and cow dung. Using their physiochemical parameters and availability, we had done the multi-criteria decision-making approach. We used the method of weighted sum method in this study. For carrying out the multi-criteria decision-making approach, we had used five-point scale where when each parameter were given equivalent linguistic term and five corresponding five-point values. 
and also we distinguish the parameters into two that is the beneficial and non-beneficial parameters where in this study we have considered the beneficial parameters the carbon hydrogen ph cellulose hemicellulose total solids volatile solids and availability and the non-beneficial parameters considered were nitrogen and lignin the point scale value were given for each parameters and were normalized according to whether it is beneficial or non-beneficial and were given equal weightage so from this study we had observed that the leaf waste was ranked the best among the feedstock according to the multi-criteria decision making approach to further validate the research findings we had collected the dry fallen leaves from the iit campus and carried out batch as well as pilot scale studies the maximum methane yield obtained in the batch scale study was 304 milliliter per gram vs input at a feeding rate of 3% ATS and a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. In the pilot scale study, which was done in a 300 liter biogas plant, the best output was 266 milliliter per gram vs input at 5% ATS at an average temperature range of 30 to 39 degrees Celsius. With optimized conditions achieved, we have we are now planning to upscale the proposed strategy in a 25 meter cube biogas plant already established at IIT Delhi campus for a one year study. Some of the relevant st uh, studies that is being done in parallel to this study is the co-digestion of fallen leaves with the low pH substrate such as kitchen waste, quantification of leaf biomass generation on a species level basis, full scale level application of co-digesting dry fallen leaves and kitchen waste in a 25 meter cube biogas plant, field scale application of the developed strategy for household level application in rural area, integration of thermochemical processes such as pyrolysis and hydrothermal carbonization with anaerobic digestion for improved performance and also we are evaluating the biohydrogen production potential of dry fallen leaves and the co-digestion of dry fallen leaves and kitchen waste. This research work is a part of Indo-Hungarian joint project funded by the Department of Science and Technology. If anyone is interested in our research work, may go through these publications or contact me in person for further details. This is our laboratory situated at the Mahatma Gandhi Gramode Parisa known as the Biogas Production Enrichment, Enrichment and Bottling Laboratory, IIT Delhi headed by Virendra Kumar Vijay, Dr. Ramchandra and Professor PMV Subarao. Currently we have 15 PhD students working on various streams such as biogas and biohydrogen production, biogas upgradation low pressure biomethane storage, utilization of biomethane in light duty vehicles, utilization of bio CO2 for prop cultivation and storage. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Moving on, the next speaker is Roshan Zhu, head of the Battery Energy Storage Technology Laboratory, Huaneng Clean Energy Research Institute, Beijing. He will be talking to us on lithium ion battery energy storage integration technology. I request you to kindly turn on your camera while your presentation is played. Hello everyone, it's a great honor to participate in the second Shanghai Cooperation Organization Young Scientists Conclave. My name is Xu Chen from China Huanan Group, an electric power company. The theme of my speech is Listen I'm Battery Energy Storage Integration Technology. My speech is divided into four parts, including requirement background, technology introduction, engineering applications, and summary. First is the requirement background. China strives to reach the carbon peak by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. The preparation of non-fossil energy in primary energy consumption will reach about 25% and the total installed capacity of wind and solar power 
will reach more than 1.2 billion, billion kilowatts as a key supporting technology for a high proportion of renewable energy. Energy storage technology is indispensable in the process of promoting the low carbon transformation of global electricity. It will be an important support for promoting the large scale development and utilization of renewable energy. Energy storage technology has a variety of forms and technical routes including physical energy storage, thermal energy storage, electrochemical energy storage, hydrogen energy storage, and other energy storage. Electrochemical energy storage is one of the most competitive energy storage technologies. Its application scenario includes power grid frequency control, Distance stability, new energy access. The advantages are high energy density, high energy conversion efficiency, fast reaction speed, and long cycle life. However, the disadvantages of electrochemical energy storage include potential safety hazards poor overcharge resistance and a complex protection circuit. The explosive growth of electrochemical energy storage has benefited from the fuel policies and the rapid development of new energy. A huge industry has been formed. With the continuous progress of battery technology and the further expansion of scale, the cost of lithium-ion battery energy storage will decline steadily. Refer to the safety, lithium-ion batteries are flammable and explosive. Especially, the difference of battery consistency will lead to serious accident of energy storage station. We propose an advanced decentralized control energy storage system integration technology. The intelligent distributed control battery energy storage technology adopts the distributed architecture and refined control of battery cluster and conventor module. The technology solves the problem of parallel mismatch and circulation, improving the security and availability. Based on this technology, the world's first 100 MW, 200 MW hours distributed energy storage power station has been built. The energy station has 236,000 cells. The average system efficiency reaches 87.2%, and the system capacity availability exceeds 92%. The results reach the industry leading level. Module and the refined management of each battery cluster can effectively reduce internal consumption and lead the world in comprehensive performance indicators. One charge and discharge of the energy station is equivalent to about 30,000 tons of decompression coal, and one charge can meet about 1,000 households' monthly electricity consumption. The performance of energy storage system integration of Huanan Clean Energy Research Institute exceeded 1,000 megawatt hours and is expected to reach 2,000 megawatt hours in June 2023. In summary, the decentralized control technology significantly enhances the safety and the reliability of the battery system. 
it effectively improves the system efficiency, available capacity, and reduces the cost of kilowatt-hour electricity. The technology has contributed to the scale and industrialization of new energy storage. It has important practical significance for building a new power system and achieving the carbon neutral and the carbon peak goals. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. We now move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker of the session is Yusupov Kuyanch, uh, lecturer at Atirao University of Oil and Gas. The title for the talk is Green Energy. I request you to turn on your camera while your presentation is played. Good afternoon. Dear participants of the conference, my name is Kwame Shizuko. I am lecturer at the Atro Oil and Gas University, named after Saki Uchibai in the educational program Industrial Power Engineering. I present to you attention the presentation of the report on the topic Green Energy. Initial with I want to say that the city of Atra, where I live, is the oil capital of Kazakhstan. In my report, I want to focus on green energy in the Atra region. The climate of the Atra region is characterized by short continentally as well as hot, dry desert step zone. Summer is hot, long with air temperatures up to 43 to 45 degrees Celsius. During the year, gusty winds with a speed of 70 to 22 meters to second air often afterwards. Green energy is energy resources that are environmentally Friendly energy sources. Green energy depends on the development of renewable energy sources, energy conservation resource conservation and waste management. Renewable energy sources are used not only for the construction of large power plants, but is popular in everyday life. Following their example, this technology is spreading all over the world, gaining its popularity and benefiting people and others. It unloads thermal power plants that pollute the atmosphere. Clean air is one of the most important environmental resources. In addition, on all the reasons for the Relevance of renewable energy sources is worth noting the savings on electricity. Environmental justification. Renewable energy sources form the point of life of ecology and the most preferred way of obtaining energy science. They do not harm the environment. If you look at the principle of operation of renewable energy sources, you can immediately understand this. Solar panels do not pollute water or air, which is one of the cleanest ways to generate energy. A wind turbine is as clean as south of energy as solar panels. Both of the sources use Enix how usable sources of energy. It's worth noting that renewable energy sources will have a positive impact on the ecology of the city where the animal world also lies. From an economic point of life, it's necessary to pay attention to the scale of the project. 
the larger the scale, the greater the cost. Accordingly, it's necessary to carry out a lot of calculations and a detailed analysis for the of the supplier market, the size of purchases and the possibility of purchase discount. With a large purchase of goods, the important point here. The price of the goods, installation work, shipping cost. Green energy needs to be introduced into the infrastructure of Atra to reduce air pollution, solve the problem of power, outages, bring energy to a new modern relevant level. The essence of the topic of the report is quite simple. To make a smooth transition to renewable energy sources and create a new environmentally friendly and relatively cheap system for obtaining energy from index how usable energy sources permanently solve the issue of air pollution from a thermal power plant with a final solution with energy fluctuations improve the life of the population in the Atra region. First, you need to calculate how much energy a residential apartment building consumes per hour, fee, day, and month. Then calculate the installation location of the roof. And you can install solar panels on them. When we can power an apartment building for a cool mass, then it's worth thinking about the whole area. Next, it will be necessary to build a set of solar panels and wind turbines and see the to one center in the area from where you can monitor the operation of the renewable energy sources. Then we will gradually unload the thermal power plant. As a result, our OJs will disappear, air pollution will decrease. The connection diagram of the solar battery looks like this. Direct current flow draws the wire to the controller. Direct current is distributed by the controller into two branches on leads to the battery to charge it. The second switch device that consumes direct current. Direct current is supplied from the battery to the inverter. From the inverter, the alternating current is sent to the junction box. This report uh, consists of environmental and economic justification and the main parts. From all of the above, it's worth noting that green energy has a great prospect. When uh, implemented, it's possible to pin a new page in obtaining safe and clean energy. The implementation of green energy will entail many advantages that will cause many disadvantages of ecology. As a teacher, I want to mention that Atra Oil and Gas University hosts lecture and laboratory class on the subjects of human conventional and renewable energy sources. On this topic, my student Alan Buratsky spoke in the final of the Intellectual Competition Student Energy Challenge Junior organized by the Kazenergy Association in partnership and with the 
Continental Support of Shell Kazakhstan. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for the illuminating talk. Moving on, the next speaker of the session is Said Zoda Khushdil, Associate Professor, Tajik Technical Hi, dear University. The title for the talk is Possibility of Use of Renewable Energy for the System Power Supply to Rural Consumers in Republic of Tajikistan. I request you to turn on your camera while your presentation is played. Colleagues, I'm Said Zoda Khushin Said, candidate of technical sciences, associate professor of Tajik Technical University, named after academician Osimi. My report is called Possibility of the Use Renewable Energy for the System Power Supply to Rural Consumers in Republic of Tajikistan. In recent years, the energy system of the Republic of Tajikistan is the stage of restoration and modernization. The current state of the energy system, despite the introduction in 2016 and 2019, the Dushanbe thermal power plant with a capacity of 400 megawatt and the, the Rogun hydro power plant with a capacity of 450 megawatt are unable to meet the still daily growing demand for electricity. This situation is especially problematic for rural consumers located in the mountainous region of the country. A significant part of these consumers receive electricity in a limited amount, which hinders their socio-economic development in general. It is worth highlighting the Murgab district of Gorno Badashan Autonomous Region, which is potentially for able for the implementation of project with renewable energy resource of for the following reasons. Advantage shows geographical location, the possibility of using large areas and acceptable natural and climatic conditions. Availability of power supply resource from the main transmission lines. No need to transport electricity over long distance due to the proximity to centralized consumers' networks. The purpose of the presented work is the reduce to reduce the cost of the selected facility for electricity supply and gain experience in the implementation and operation of power plants of alternative and renewable energy resources for further use and increase in the share of renewable energy resources in the energy balance of the region. Now about characteristic of the existing state of the power supply system of the Murugab rural settlement. In the high mountainous Murugab settlement, there is one small hydropower plant which called Tajikistan. Electricity is supplied to the village from the small hydroelectric power station owned by Pamir Energy using a 10 kV power transformer line with a total length of 22 km and a voltage 1.4 power transmission line 18 km. The power supply of the village is carried out from the outdoor switch gear, 10 kV, small hydroelectric power station through 29 transformer substation of various capacities. In this picture, we can see the Murugab rural uh, settlement and uh, existing there the small hydropower plant. Uh, which is called uh, Tajikistan, with a capacity of 1.5 megawatt. Now, determination of daily and seasonal load in the village of Murga. Setting the tasks of, to provide each house in the Murga village with electricity, an independent source of energy supply, one should focus on 
local energy resource, mainly renewable. The main task was to choose an object the schedule of electricity com consumption for which would be as close as possible to the schedule for solar activity. All these cases require determining the amount of electricity consumption for each house. To concept of the calculated electrical load, active power, I mean, of a consumer of network elements means a power equal to the expected maximum load in 13 minutes. Using the statistical data, we will draw up the graphs of the load by the seasons. You can see it in fire chart number one. Here there is an electrical receiver and the power of the electric receiver in active power and utilization rate. Some of pictures in schedule of a lot power. Now about the determination of the solar potential of the Murgab settlement. Determination of solar ins installation. Installation is based on long-term data from the meteorological station located in the area. Data of the power of solar radiation incident incident during the year on an area of one of a horizontal surface and the surface perpendicular of the sun's rays according to the NASA for the terrain with coordinates corresponding to the village Murgab as shown in Fajr 2. The choice of the optimal orientation of solar panels is one of the most important issues in the practical use of solar installations of any type for the village of Murgab, the optimal angle of inclination of solar panels is 45 and 48 degrees. Here you can see the graph of the power of solar radiation falling on the surface perpendicular to the sun's rays and horizontal throughout the year. Just about now about the synchronization of solar power plant with centralized grid. The synchronized and connect solar power plant to the power supply network of the village of Murga. We will use network inverters, which are called devices that convert direct voltage from photovoltaic system into alternating voltage. It showed in Fija number three. In table number three, show data of the cost of set of equipment, equipment and the related cost for the commissioning of a photovoltaic power plant. A photovoltaic station synchronized with the grid consists of solar cells, equipment for collecting and transmitting the generated energy by solar photovoltaic cells. Synchronized with the grid of the inverter and an electric energy meter. Photovoltaic station synchronized with the grid is devoid, devoid of the main disadvantage of the autonomous system due to the lack of storage batteries. The synchronizing system due to the built in controllers and the inverters changes the output voltage in and current currents in accord, accords with the characteristic of the centralized network.
in Figer number three, you can see a schematic diagram of the photovoltaic station synchronized with the settlement electric networks. Now about discussion of the obtained result. In the code of the energy survey, an object was selected for a pilot project of using a synchronized solar power plant without storage devices, which was supposed to reduce the cost of the pilot project and reduce financial risks. The, the solar energy system proposed for implementation of the facility is planned to cover the base load of all needs without the transmission of electricity to the centralized power supply network. All the generated energy will be used for the technological needs of the storage battery buildings. This photovoltaic system is designed to reduce the cost of electricity consumed. Conclusions the paper considers the possibility of installing solar photovoltaic system to partially replace the electricity received by the village from the centralized power supply system. For this, the possibility <coughs> of using solar photovoltaic installation for power supply of the high mountainous Murugab settlement was considered. An assessment was made of the potential for the development of solar energy in the Morgab region. The result of assessing the climate conditions of this region showed that due to the increased solar activity in the region under consideration, the use of solar panels for power supply of the village is relevant. The presence of large areas makes it possible to install of sufficient number of solar panels which will make it possible to cover a significant part of the village's load schedule during the daytime. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. We now move on to the last talk of this thematic session. The speaker is Pushkarev Artem Sarvich, head of the PEM Fuel Cells Laboratory, National Research Center, Khrushchev Institute. The title for the talk is Water Electrolyzers Based on Ion Exchange Membranes. I request you to kindly turn on your camera while your presentation is played. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my talk on the second SEO Young Scientists Conclave. My name is Artyom Pushkarev, and I tell you about the recent pro progress in research and development of water electrolyzers based on ion exchange membranes obtained in our laboratory. Let me start with a few words about our institution. Kurchatov Institute was founded in Moscow in 1943, and it is one of the leading research centers and the largest multidisciplinary research institute in Russia. The Department of Electrochemical and Hydrogen Technologies uh, have been studying technologies related to electrochemical energy storage and hydrogen energy for more than uh, 30 years. The, the research group has huge experience in R&D of electrochemical devices like fuel cells, electrolyzers, hydrogen and oxygen concentrators, and others. Uh, electrochemical devices, such as fuel cells and water electrolyzers, are of high importance in the context of hydrogen energy concept. Electrochemical energy storage is the only viable option to organize the long-term energy storage for various purposes. For instance, it could be used to provide autonomous uh, energy supply, or to balance the, the grid with high yield of intermittently operated renewable energy sources. Uh, basically, we talk about two main membrane-based water electrolysis technologies. 
their difference comes from different kind of e electrolyte, which is used to provide electrochemical reactions and separate the hydrogen and oxygen gases evolving in the cathode and anode respectively. Uh, the overall reaction is the same, water just splits into hydrogen and oxygen, but uh, health reactions occurring in the anode and cathode uh, uh, differs in their uh, mechanism. Uh, proton uh, conducting membrane is used in PEM systems, pro uh, providing the acidic media, and the anion exchange membrane is used in the AEM water electrolyzer, providing the alkaline uh, media. Uh, each type of water electrolyzer has its own pros and cons, but both are based on the membrane electrode assembly design, in which uh, the membrane is sandwiched between two electrodes. Uh, anode and cathode could be uh, described as a porous electrode with a catalytic layer faced to the membrane. Uh, catalysts uh, provide active uh, sites for hydrogen and oxygen uh, evolution reactions, while protons or uh, uh, hydroxyl ions go through the uh, membrane. Porous uh, electrodes play a very important role providing pure water or supporting electrolyte feeding the, uh, and the generated gases removing. Thus, in the field of proton exchange membrane electrolysis, we have focused on the electrode's design and structure to increase its uh, performance. Uh, we have developed an approach to investigate the surface morphology of porous electrodes. It is based on scanning electron microscopy and further image analysis by MSJ uh, software, which provides important morphology parameters such as average grain diameter, average uh, di uh, diameter of pore opening, and a real uh, su surface porosity. Uh, further, the bulk porous structure of porous electrodes was studied by a number of techniques such as uh, capillary flow porosimetry the uh, mercury intrusion porosimetry and x-ray uh, th uh, tomography. The combination of these methods allows to distinguish all types of pores, including continuous, closed, and dead pores, and to model the uh, transport of gas-liquid flows inside the electrode. For instance, uh, the tortuosity factor could be suggested as a generalized dimensionless value, that represents how turtles or convoluted the pathways inside the electrode. Uh, to get deep understanding how the morphology and structure of the electrode affect the electrolyzer performance, we proposed the voltage breakdown technique. The modern approach of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy have been used to access the ohmic losses of the cell, whereas other components were calculated according to the simple and reliable model. The key role of the bulk porous structure of electrodes was uh, suggested, and their morphology appeared to be a minor factor due to the features of a uh, catalyst-coated substrate approach chosen to assemble the water electrolyzer cells. Considering uh, the AEM water electrolysis, we focused on the electrode development as well, uh, considering the catalyst layer electrode interface. Among possible cell designs, uh, the one with KOH electrolyte uh, has been chosen to ensure the highest cell performance. Uh, the AEM water electrolyzer performance significantly depends on the supporting electrolyte uh, concentration and its flow rate, so we have started with the operational uh, conditions optimization. The modern approach of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy and proposed equivalent circuit with managed stray impedance were used to qualitatively and quantitatively describe the cell uh, voltage contributions. A de uh, decreased KVH concentration le uh, leads to the significant e increase in both ohmic and polarization resistance, uh, deteriorating uh, the water electrolyzer per uh, performance. So the highest electrolyte concentration at which the membrane ensures its stability was chosen for further studies. Uh, the obtained data was used to evaluate the effect of the KUH flow rate on the electrolyzer performance and to optimize it. Optimal value was chosen according to the minimum of polarization resistance. Electrochemical impedance spectroscopy provides valuable comparative data 
to separate Faraday and non-Faraday uh, contributions to the total cell voltage. Uh, to increase the membrane electrode assembly mechanical stability and performance, the introduction of microporous sublayer was proposed. The nickel foam is used as an electrode material, and its surface is directly brush coated with the sublayer, made of micron sized nickel powder particles. Moreover, uh, the uniform co contact between the cell components is achieved, le uh, leading to the increase in catalyst utilization. The sublayer structure and loading were optimized, significantly increasing the AEM water electrolyzer performance. Uh, so, to sum up, we are on the way to develop the new generation of membrane based water electrolyzers for upcoming hydrogen energy. And welcome everyone to join us on our way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. We will now move on to the question and answer session. I request the participants present here to raise their hands and our volunteers will come to you with the mics. For the online participants, kindly type in your question in the chat box. I have a question for Tinku Casper de Silva. As you have presented the selection of suitable locally available biomass as an alternate feedstock for biogas production. So I have two or three questions. Have you tried biogas slurry as a fertilizer in crop production? If yes, then what is the NPK, that means nitrogen phosphorus content in that biogas slurry? My second question, as we have seen, there is some order in the biogas which restrict most of the people for using is for as a cooking. So did you also work on removing or the order of the biogas? And last question is, what are the difficulty you have faced in the biogas pro uh, production like screening of and selection of selection of the material and anaerobic digestion that's it thank you so for the first question uh, the uh, determination of micro and micronutrients are now pending so far i haven't done that but i have t tested it by the germination test so it was successful R rather it was it was better than the uh, cattle dung slurry uh, and for the second question we have already a patented technology based on water scrubbing uh, in which the carbon dioxide is being removed so that it can be directly used as a vehicular fuel and uh, one uh, CNG car is being uh, driven using uh, the enriched biomethane and for the third question uh, me and my colleagues are working on several substrates uh, like uh, rice straw, microalgae, uh, sugarcane bagasse, dry fallen leaves, kitchen waste, etc. So main problem with the dry biomass that is the rice straw and wheat straw or maize straw, sugarcane bagasse, the lignin content is very high. So we need to pretreat it before uh, using uh, some kind of thermal or chemical pretreatment methods. Then only we can uh, use it for biomethane production so that uh, the maximum volatile solids can be uh, utilized by the microbes during the anaerobic digestion. So, yeah. As a CN ratio of the, as you have told us, you are using the, trying the rice straw. <clears throat> as, as CN ratio of rice straw is very high. Yeah. And for, if you go for the, the pre-treatment of the lignosolids material like uh, rice straw, I think the cost will be high. Production. So for that we are uh, my one of my colleague is working on co-digestion it with microalgae so that the C-band ratio is maintained and also he is pre-treating using hydrothermal yeah it is on a preliminary analysis only but uh, he is going to now uh, test in a 25 meter cube biogas plant so only after that we can say the what about the te uh, techno economics and all yeah. and which microalgae you are using. I don't know the species because I am not working on it. Uh, I will uh, ask my colleague and uh, convey you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello. So 
the question is again to the Tinku and his team. So you are doing the very marvelous job. Thank you for your presentations. So I have some queries uh, regarding this. Have you ever tried uh, using of the mixing of the fish stock? This is the first question. The second question is as you have mentioned the uh, the lignin, especially the contaminations of the lignin as one of the main problems. Have you ever tried with using the biological treatment instead of the thermochemical treatment as you have mentioned? Then the uh, the third question. Have you ever uh, tried with the specific microbes which are helping in methane generation in the biogas plant productions? These are the three questions. So can you please repeat the first question? Okay. <laughs> have you ever tried using of the mixing of the feedstock? Because you have mixing mentioned... Mixing of the feedstock before feeding into the reactor. You are talking yeah. about it. Okay. That's the first question. Yeah, we have tried uh, two type of uh, um, uh, feeding method. That is one, we have uh, mixed it uh, with water and kept it for overnight and then feed it for the next time so that the hydrolysis is already initiated. And uh, next we have tried is that we have just uh, mixed it with water and we have uh, uh, feed it into the reactor at that time only. So. Uh, we had observed that there is not much difference in the results, but uh, yeah, this is the answer for the first. What's your output in that mixing of the the blended uh, feedstock is better or the the individual feedstock is the better? The overnight kept uh, uh, mixture was a uh, little bit better, but when we see the significance, there wasn't much significance on the total output. Yeah. Okay. It might be because uh, in my case, the feedstock was dry fallen leaves and uh, kitchen waste. So both the uh, materials are uh, having less lignin content. So I think that might be the reason. I, I don't know much about the proper lignocellulosic biomass because I am not working on that. My colleagues are working on that. Yeah, they, have, they might have faced some problems like lo uh, less hydrolysis mm, if uh, they are feeding on that time itself with water. So the second question was the, the lignin contaminations. Yeah. You have done through the uh, the thermal pretreatment methods? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. In my case, the lignin content was very low. It was below 7 to 8 percentage in the fallen leaves as well. So I haven't done any thermo thermochemical pretreatment before feeding into the reactor. Yeah, I have just grind, uh, uh, grinded it and just uh, mixed it, mixed it, uh, it, uh, it with water and then fed it into the reactor. Yeah. But pretreatment is very essential in the, you know. Yes, in the case of lignocellulosic biomass, yes. The last question was any specific microbes they are using? You have identified or isolated for the methane generations? Uh, the microbial community analysis test is also pending because of the fund shortage and we will be doing it very soon yeah is there any we haven't uh, isolated some any kind of bacteria for uh, making the inoculum mm -hmm. we have uh, prepared it from the fresh cow dung and kept it for days for so that the methanogens develop uh, the local bacteria that, uh, will be developed in that and we are using the same inoculum for the uh, startup of the reactor yeah is there any person working on the 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 value additions of the lignin in your research lab? Yes, in my, not my, in my research lab, but in my center. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have an online question for uh, Tinku De Silva from Pixi Zhu from Zhejiang University of Technology in China. Do you know the main components of the material, such as the dry fallen leaves? Is it possible to make more full use of the leaves? First, extract some useful components, then produce biogas? Yeah, uh, now my aim is to produce uh, biohydrogen initially from the dry fallen leaves and then use it for the methane generation. Yeah, any other uh, biofuels can also be prepared from that, um, like uh, bioethanol or biobutanol, etc. And it can be the uh, bioproduct can be used for methane production as well. Okay. 
Thank you. There is also an online question for Said Zoda. In this region, over the past five years, have many hydropower plants been built? I mean, uh, Bada Khan. He means uh, Bada Khan. Okay, I think uh, uh, Said Zoda is not online with us. Okay, any more questions? My question will be for the first report about the burning gas. Uh, from your report, uh, there was a lot of information about yield of the biogas, yeah. and it's better to use only leaves, as we can see. And could you clarify uh, what is better uh, if we will talk about the uh, octane number? What is better to use, leaves or another material? Uh this parameter and okay, uh, number of the fuel produced leaf Which, uh, pardon i mean i mean the octane number for traditional um, sources and for your material did you measure uh, did you did you measure this parameter or not no no octane number yeah. yes mm -hmm. no i have not analyzed it yeah i think that it will be interesting to to use it okay. and uh, the another question will be about the uh, foreign collaborations uh, do you collaborate with another countries and with another scientific groups for example maybe from uh, france or germany uh, which work in a similar area yeah the uh, project i am working on is already collaborated with the country hungary and uh, in the university of Ziegert uh, with the professor cornel kovacs so we are working on uh, developing a two-stage anaerobic digestion for simultaneous hydrogen and methane production. Uh, so we are uh, doing the technical part and they are, the, they are having the background of uh, biotechnology. So we are having some uh, uh, scientific collaborations with them. Yeah. Thank you. It's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now stop the question answer session and move on with the thematic discussion. Okay, one last question, maybe. My question is to Pushkarev Artom Sergeyevich. Uh, you give us information about uh, water electrolyzers, but here in the world we have some problematic areas where we cannot find much water. Is it possible to use all the systemic, uh, like uh, your research? the year or it's not possible uh, so uh, i would say that uh, for both uh, uh, membrane based technologies uh, we basically need the rather pure water so so then uh, from the other uh, hand we we, uh, we we don't need uh, to have like a plenty of water so uh, it's just a question of uh, uh, of the usage of the water with a very high uh, pu purity uh, uh, standard like dionite water or uh, medium poor uh, quality water. So uh, I would say that we still can use this uh, technology uh, in any place. So it could be de uh, designed in a very uh, portable uh, design. Only where we can find pure water. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Thank so you. we, we uh, anyway, we should we should supply uh, the pure one. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of our session on sustainable energy and energy storage. A big round of applause for all the participants. We will now proceed with the thematic discussion on this session. We kindly request all the speakers from our thematic session from yesterday and today to take the stage right now for this discussion. The participants who joined us online may turn on their videos for the discussion. During this session, we look forward to having a fruitful discussion on the challenges we face in the field of sustainable energy and energy storage currently in our respective countries and work on how to overcome the obstacles of funding. Let us also put our opinions forward about the unique expertise each of the participating nations have achieved in the field and how we can actively collaborate and help each other.
Okay. The participants who joined us online <laughs> yesterday may turn on their videos for the discussion. It is my great pleasure to now introduce you all to the session chairs. Dr. BLV Prasad is currently working as the director of Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences, Bangalore. He also holds the position of chief scientist in the physical materials chemistry division of National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, India. He completed his master of science and PhD degrees in chemistry from Hyderabad Central University after two postdoctoral stints, one at Tokyo Institute of Technology and second at Kansas State University, he joined NCL in 2003. In 2021, he has assumed the office of director, Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences, Bangalore. His group is actively working in the general area of material synthesis and in particular nanoparticles and nanoscale materials. I invite our chair, Dr. Prasad, to say a few words. Uh, uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, my apologies for not being able to come there physically due to another uh, prior commitment. Uh, I compliment all the speakers uh, yesterday and today uh, for giving a nice overview uh, of the work. And uh, I could see that you know, there are talks that are related to uh, uh, fundamental science and uh, like development of materials to uh, technology development, for example, like you know, the the palladium-based uh, alloys for hydrogen separation or the uh, the uh, crystal chlor chloride supraionic uh, system that were developed yesterday to feasibility studies that were presented, for example, a lot of questions on biogas uh, today morning and uh, the uh, the colleague from Tajikistan and then like, you know, Professor Yu Chao yesterday about like, you know, how we can basically optimize the charging scenario uh, for an electric uh, mobility vehicles in a city. So this was a very, very enriching experience even for me personally. And I hope the same uh, is echoed by the other participants. Uh, I obviously look forward to uh, you know, having a fruitful discussion and uh, a, a collaborative effort uh, that can really help all the uh, you know, participating countries in taking this very, very important field uh, uh, forward uh, so that you know, the uh, the global uh, situation can be improved in whatever uh, way it can be. So I uh, now request maybe uh, my co-chair, uh, Dr. Ramakrishna Mate, uh, to say a few words, and then like, maybe we can start the discussion. Dr. Mate, currently working as a scientist D at Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences, he obtained MS PhD in Chemical Sciences under the guidance of Professor Sienna Rao from the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, working on various aspects of nanomaterials. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University from 2013 to 2015 under the guidance of Professor Mark C. Hersim and Professor Tobin J. Marks in the area of organic solar cells. Later, he moved to Professor Nobert Koch's group at Humboldt University, Berlin, to work on doping of organic semiconductors. His current research interests are printed electronics, low-dimensional materials, electrochemical en energy storage devices, and organic photovoltaics. I request Dr. Mate to kindly say a few words and open this session for discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the kind. Uh, so, uh, before going to the panel discussion, uh, I'll try to summarize the talks which are given in this last uh, two sessions and then from there we'll talk about. So total we had uh, 12 talks out of which five belongs to fuel cells and LED areas. One is on supercapacitors and one biogas and five are on batteries. Uh, in the first talk where uh, Nikhil Kumar discussed about the use of perovskite based materials for proton ceramic electrolysis and fuel cells. And even over discussed about the new materials and particularly making of the new materials methods uh, based on CNT for proton exchange membranes. Praveen Kumar discussed about the usage of 2D materials, uh, utilizing the concept of spin manipulation and vessel plane activation for photoelectrochemical activation. And Izum has discussed about the growth of fluoride-based crystals to increase the energy density of uh, fluoride-based batteries, which is also an uh, upcoming topic. 
uh, Zingbo discussed about the uh, technique utilizing and molecular, uh, molecular dynamic simulations for understanding the high performance supercapacitors. Gurumunan proposed the usage of palladium alloys for separation of uh, hydrogen purification, which is also one of those uh, interesting topics. And Yuko discussed about the possible options of EV charging ranging from swapping of batteries to uh, vehicle to vehicle charging as well. Uh, today we have talks by Pushkarev where he discussed about the water electrolyzed based ion exchange membranes and Thinku discussed which is again discussed a lot about the available local available biomass as an alternative feedstock for biogas production in rural India. And then Rujan discussed about the safety and the performance aspects of the lithium ion batteries. And then Yusupu gave the overview of the green energy and also provided the engineering solutions for effective utilization. And whereas Saizdo discussed about the possibility use of renewable energy for the system power supply, particularly in the rural consumers of uh, Republic of Tajikistan. So with this uh, uh, overview, we would uh, I would like to take this discussion uh, for the panel discussion where I have uh, four different uh, aspects which I thought would uh, give some uh, interesting conversations. And the first uh, topic uh, which I would like to propose for the discussion and I would like to know the uh, opinion of the SEO members and uh, uh, others who are sitting here uh, is as we keep talking about global problems with global solutions, which for sure is an important aspect to consider. But along with that, uh, what I have a slightly different view is the global problems with local solutions. What I mean by this is, as you know, during COVID, the whole supply chain has broken. So now uh, it is important to have an interdependency. But at the same time, when you are looking for the future, it is also important to have solutions which you can address locally. What I mean by is every country has its own resources. Uh, in terms of the natural resources, be it minings or the ores. And then all the systems that what you are talking about, the sustainable energy, is depends on the materials at core. So instead of providing a, only one material, which is available in only specific parts of the world, are there any interest or there any research going in different SEO countries about utilizing their own resources for solving the global problems? So I wanted to know if there are anything which is being carried out in other SEO nations. If not, what one could do and what are your opinions on that? So with that, I'll start the uh, panel discussion and whoever is interested uh, may take the mic and uh, uh, give their opinions. Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. Oh, I think uh, uh, people need uh, energy, yes. Uh, and... Uh, Unfortunately, in many countries now we really need a cheap energy to cheap energy uh, for improve uh, the population uh, level of life. Yes, and I think uh, my um, research uh, is now expensive, too expensive. Yes, and uh, in European countries. Uh, the government maybe can help and have uh, enough money to develop and to improve its new, its interest in uh, researches, but expensive. And I think uh, the natural gas, it's interesting for a local network of power sources in India. I think it's good uh, and it's uh, nowadays now it's more important but uh, uh, we need to improve all of the ways to produce energy now yes and uh, we need to have uh, different ways the solar energy uh, rivers all of uh, the sources and we need to combine these sources sometimes uh maybe we can pay more but if we can use uh, solar energy more cheaper we should do it because uh, in our countries people sometimes need cheaper energy more than <laughs> development but the science need uh, to go because um, we need to improve our science yes for future for future 
we need to be stable in energy, but we need to improve in other ways for future because uh, sometimes maybe the cost uh, re decreased and we can apply it and we can distribute this network of uh, lower power generation. That's why I think uh, all of this research is very important, yes. Some of these are for future, some of this we need uh, nowadays, but we need to improve all of these ways and combine it. Combine. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to uh, agree with my colleague and uh, all of energy, uh, all of research is very interesting and uh, we can support it, uh, you know, like a Pareto principle and 10% uh, uh, of scientists uh, develop something and 90% uh, just a statistic, <laughs> you know. Uh, the second uh, about collaboration and uh, between countries uh, in the first uh, it depend on uh, supply and demand and as a country uh, is uh, uh, as a region and uh, as a climate and uh, for Russia and uh, it's a no and uh, I want to I, I want to say and uh, something sweet for Russia, but it doesn't sweet uh, from India and uh, otherwise, and uh, it's come difficult sometimes. But uh, uh, never mind. Uh, we can. Uh, <clears throat> help each other. Uh, the third, um, I want to say about uh, a new sources of energy like uh, mine and uh, uh, and my point of view and uh, now and I'm developed uh, fluoride and uh, tysonite uh, on the crystal and it's so expensive and uh, uh, and our uh, source of energy is uh, already uh, expensive, uh, but uh, also uh, the more productive and uh, three, four, six uh, times than uh, the modern times of, you know, for example, batteries. And uh, you know, it's a worldwide problem. And uh, for developing something new, uh, we should refuse something old, uh, refused from, uh, you know, for example, uh, a cheap uh, uh, <clears throat> acid lead uh, batteries. Uh, it's uh, no for me. It's a dirty technology and it's overdated technology right now. But uh, for uh, business, uh, I think it's a, a profitable, a profitable technology. Um, but it's uh, a dead lock uh, for uh, humankind. And it's my point of view. Thanks. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I go with uh, both of my colleagues. Uh, of course, we require uh, a material which is not only be sustainable, but also affordably. So a lot of effort is already been going uh, in India. And I hope uh, you are well aware about uh, in SEO countries as well. Like uh, some of the examples I can give it to you, like a lot of people are working uh, from waste to wealth. Like they are using uh, either dairy waste, electronic waste, and they are trying to convert that uh, into nanomaterials that can be utilized in a um, lot of applications, including the renewable energies, okay? And uh, I, I think I echo that uh, the solar cells is the best examples. They have started from uh, a very you know, high costly material, and now you can see the silicon solar cells. They are very effective and are available everywhere. So this is how other technology like I'm working on uh, hydrogen generation. And uh, that's where you uh, need to develop a new material, new combinations of the material, which uh, not only are the stable, but also the efficient. So that is where we are trying to uh, invent some of the materials like a uh, 2D materials, uh, which is having a very high active area and also not that much costly. So we are trying to develop the processes, which is uh, not that uh, costly, very facile processes. So this is how I think uh, over the time, uh, as uh, we evolve the technology, I think we will have uh, some very advanced uh, material combinations. So to uh, give some better solution for uh, coming up uh, renewable energy solutions. That's what I think of. You have anything? So any comments from the online uh, attendance? Okay, 
so if not i'll go to the uh, second topic for the uh, discussion oh may i yeah please i think uh, we need now for research the government support yes <laughs> and i think uh, the governments in our country can uh, help us in cooperation yes uh, for support maybe different uh, funds research funds and maybe maybe this event can uh support us in future yes maybe some project uh international project by our governments yes we really need it i think <laughs> i think it's important to say yes so yeah uh and the second topic which i would like to bring for the discussion is uh the technology translation as we all know most of us work on the fundamental aspects of it and when we do in the laboratory we talk about very uh devices of small area like uh, sometimes ranging from millimeters to centimeter square but in the real life or for the practical use we need to make them in bulk scale or the large area devices and though we might see very fundamentally interesting principles or uh, phenomena at the lab scale devices uh, it's not very common to see them in a translational aspect so have you seen any support from uh, any of the uh, corresponding or your respective countries where the schemes are there for uh, particularly from a translational perspective where you have a central facilities of fabricating like for example somebody prepares a method which is novel but it is in lab scale we don't know whether it really works in the real life scenario so uh what is the opinion or the ongoing efforts in different scv nations about the translational aspect particularly converting this wealth of the fundamental knowledge to a technology translation from a large area device perspective so maybe from a biogas perspective you may start and then i'll ask others to take it forward in their own areas be it batteries or uh, hydrogen generation so at our lab what we do is that uh, we uh, take the literature review and uh, the um, whatever materials that can be used for biogas generation are uh, listed out and we uh, do the laboratory scale assessment and take this to the uh, um, full scale ap uh, plant application that that is what our research is based on that if we, i am working on dry fallen leaves then i can uh, uh take the uh, laboratory scale research to the full scale full scale plant operation then if it is successful enough then we can provide a solution for the society that's what i want to say so anyone else want to comment uh i i can talk about uh <laughs> my research and uh, from uh from a big scale, uh, I think it's a bit problematic and uh, we need more research. And, uh, you know, uh, in the previous talk, my colleague again <laughs> talked about uh, support of our government and we support our, uh, we need support of investor, investors uh, to meet our needs uh, and uh, for uh, developing something uh, cheap. Uh, for a big scale I and mean, then make uh, our technology more cheaper. Uh, because you know, uh, I talk about uh, crystal growth and uh, widespread technique. It's uh, Chekhrysky and uh, uh, Bridgman's uh, technique. And we develop something new and uh, you know, it's in principle, it costs enough and uh, for um, uh, a bake uh, through an uh, other field. Uh, we need more investment uh, in this field. You know. Thanks. Uh, I have a comment here, Dr. Yeah. Mate, if you. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, I my suggestion or a comment on uh, at this point of time is: uh, Is there a way, uh, at least the uh, CEO nations? Uh, take some of the research which is uh, slightly at an advanced level or whatever you can call as this technology readiness level of maybe four and five and you know see uh, whether like you know, there is a another collaborator at any other country 
uh, among the participating nations that can uh, uh, work together so that this can be translated as uh, uh, Dr. Ramakrishna Mathe pointed out and it's a very important point of translating this work. And sometimes maybe we do lack uh, you know, the knowledge that is generated at a laboratory in the relevant form that uh, an investor, uh, somebody was mentioning about that, at any other place, at any other country, may be interested in investing. So I think you know, one of the things that probably could come out of this meeting is kind of collating such an information and putting it uh, available. You know, so it need not be exactly the technology that has been used, but you know, what is the main parameters that the technology is uh, trying to solve, as somebody was mentioning about the crystals of uh, fluorides, or like, you know, the palladium-based uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, alloys that were uh, for hydrogen separation. So could this be kind of uh, you know, put together in a form uh, that now probably can bring a uh, uh, kind of investors. My suggestion also to all the people to look at uh, what is uh, the life cycle analysis of uh, these, uh, whatever the technology. Somebody mentioned uh, yesterday in their presentation about how long, how many times or you know, at what time you may have to replace the technology or you know, replace the cartridge uh, for a separation, for example. So what is the life cycle analysis that is being done? I think that is also important for all of us to consider. And finally, uh, as again, you know, it started with what happens to the material that we develop after it kind of, you know, it has lived its life for a set technology. What kind of a recovery processes that we are kind of trying to look at? So I think these are also important, and I think we as a community should be should impress on our governments and then policy makers that like, you know, recovery is an extremely important uh, thing. Like, you no, know, it could be cobalt, it could be lithium, it could be any any material, as you probably know, uh, there is a new version of periodic table that is being put, where it is mentioned that some of the uh, elements might disappear in a, in, a, uh, uh, in a recoverable form or in a form that can be used for future uh, generations for any application. So please consider this, and you know, if somebody wants to make a comment on this, I would be very happy to listen to. Yes, uh, Professor Prashad, uh, I, I I agree with you, and I wanted to convey the similar way like this. Uh, the see, like uh, there are two uh, different aspects. Okay, one is working on the fundamental, and other is working on the technology aspects. So, if uh, these two can collaborate and uh, try to understand what fundamental person is doing, and uh, if fundamental can understand what uh, is required to convert that fundamental into technology, I think that is going to be the long way. So that is where if we can uh, incorporate uh, some of the industries who's, who are working in particularly in that area and take their help or uh, give whatever fundamentally we have developed at our lab, I think uh, that way we can uh, go a little longer and also the technology can be verified and also can be developed uh, in a longer way. And of course, I agree uh, with Professor Prashad that uh, we have to uh, develop some strategy so that we can collaborate together, we can uh, write uh, the joint project so that we can uh, get the support funding uh, to uh, work together. Yeah, in that way. Do you have anything to comment? Yes, uh, yeah, please. about production. Yes, I think uh, it's uh, have uh, another side. Yes, because we produce for people. And I think people could understand uh, that they really need it. <laughs> and if a uh, person could understand that our devices really improve their lives, it will be simple for us uh, to s uh, sell it, yes, uh, for people. And I think a good example is a computer, because uh, the first computer is a big machine for a small group of people, yes, but now all of us use it. And I think it's normal way for a complex uh, technology, yes. Uh, people should understand, we, we should uh, uh, research we should uh, improve our devices for people uh, and uh, make it possible to they understand that they really need it and they really good device and uh, uh, in, in this uh, step uh, um, we can uh, uh, create a new energy source because uh, uh, we are really need to work not only for science yes for knowledges but we should work for people and people should understand that we work for uh, for the, for human yes for humanity yeah. and the uh, uh, last part of the discussion which i would like to bring is about 
uh, the sustainability, recyclability, and circular economy. So when we are talking about developing uh, sustainable energy and energy storage devices, so to what extent we are keeping these things in mind from producing the materials from a sustainable perspective to re as Professor uh, Bilvi uh, Prashad commented about the recyclability and what is even more important is to bring the circular economy into the back because uh, uh, down the line there is a high possibility some of the uh, elements could extend from the periodic table because of their unavailability. So are these things are being uh, uh, taken as a serious thought before uh, designing the problems or uh, what are the thoughts from your side on addressing these three aspects? Uh, as I said, sustainability, circular economy and recyclability. Any comments on this would be welcome. Okay, I agree with you. I think uh, I really like the statement that uh, we should make our planet more good for our child. Yes, yes, our child should live better than, than us. I think uh, people should understand it, that uh, we need, maybe I'm a woman, <laughs> but I think it's, it's really a nice task to make our planet, to make our life more better for our child. Yes, because we love it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, our, uh, it's our uh, decision to have child. And uh, I think uh, all parents, all people want uh, for uh, this, uh, for child, a better life. Yes. And uh, recycling, uh, it's uh, a global problem. Uh, use a renewable energy source uh, to um, uh, prolongation of the lifetime of the devices. It's uh, important and in fuel cell, uh, the durability is uh, the big issue and a lot of research work on this problem. Now, uh, to <laughs> prolongation the lifetime, yes. Uh, but uh, I think uh, some steps in uh, our uh, our science we do we can remove uh, platinum from the devices now yes and we can uh, use it uh, in new uh, and uh, I think it's 80 percent we can remove uh, it's good I think yes but uh, it's a global problem with uh, lithium battery it's a problem uh, now uh, it's recycled too, yes, and in many countries we can, uh, we can uh, get it back, get it back, yes, in spatial uh, place to recycle. I think uh, now people think about it and work about it and we really need more because um, more time. <laughs> Because I, I um, compare with um, atomic power, yes, and in uh, atomic power they want to uh, get a, a cycle, uh, nuclear materials, but they work it, <laughs> work it, working, have been working uh, for many years, and I think we uh, should. Um, uh, have more time and uh, work about it and eat good, <laughs> eat good. <laughs> it's enough, it's enough. <laughs> uh, no, and uh, my think of your uh, this question and uh, you know, I guess uh, we can reduce our wishes in our countries and you know, and many times uh, we use a lot of things and uh, I think uh, over supply electricity, over supply, over supply uh, plastics, and uh, think like that. And uh, uh, now I think uh, we should uh, we we have to be more eco economy uh, to provide economy in our countries, and uh, we can um, uh, make our resources free for developing something new and. Uh, I think it's uh, viable technology. Uh, it, uh, support uh, our, our science and uh, things like that. 
Thanks. Yes. Uh, okay. Again, I uh, second all my colleagues. Uh, but uh, to be honest, like uh, if I would rather say that uh, sustainability uh, and uh, recyclability, or I would say the affordability, all are interconnected. So if I am doing the research, which uh, uh, the required uh, like a feed stock is available in my country, so things become uh, much cheaper for me, and also the development becomes much more friendlier for me. So that is where if we uh, look forward or we make uh, our effort uh, effort in such a way so that uh, we have uh, the feed stock uh, in abundance. Okay, so that is where we can go for that technology in a longer way. And uh, we cannot rely on the novel metal, of course. Okay, so we have to find out some alternative of that. That is what uh, new materials are coming up. And uh, now India is also looking after a lot of semiconductor industries to develop a new material. So to have a replacement in a better efficiency in such a way. And also, uh, see, whatever uh, we are using, let's say if I talk about the renewable energy, I say that uh, the hydrogen also, gray hydrogen, black hydrogen, green hydrogen. So I am talking about the renewable energy. So what is the meaning of having the gray and black hydrogen? So these kind of effort has to be made in such a way so that uh, if I am talking about the renewable, that it has to be, feed stock has to be renewable. It's not, it should not be the gasoline or coal. So if we can make our effort in such a way so that uh, we can have a long-term plan that will benefit all the SEO countries as well. And uh, we'll definitely will come up some solution which will uh, uh, be giving up green energy, green and sustainable energy in the future. Uh, that is what I... Uh, uh, maybe, yeah. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, the panel discussion and thank you very much for your active participation. And as a, con uh, as a result of our discussions, probably one could propose from this panel discussion is in lines with uh, BRICS proposal where all the BRICS nations have a joint call for collaborative work. Maybe there could be an SCO uh, proposals as well where all the SCO nations could work together uh, and where there will be a funding from this. So we'll try to propose from our side as part of the uh, panel discussion and see how it works from the government side. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, I really thank for the uh, choice and these things for arranging the discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for being part of this intellectual and very informative discussion. At this occasion, I would like to present the chair, Dr. Ramakrishna Mate, with a small token of our gratitude. Uh, this is an announcement for the Indian participants.